a little bit, but I was going to tell Matt the story of why I have a really hard time not moving around. I used to be a public school teacher. I taught high school and middle school in some really, really, really brutal schools, which I absolutely loved. The kids would sometimes, if I turned my back, there were usually rival gangs in the class. Whoa. And sometimes, depending on the vibe that day, I would turn and I would turn back and there would be just like threats or fights or whatever. And so what I used to do was, I would do it really slow, I used to just walk around and I'd catch eye contact and I could just touch. I want to touch the kids. This is 20 some odd years ago. So, I got in that habit just so I could tell exactly what the vibe was that was happening in the room. And so I don't do that anymore because there's a lot of time people filming. But what I like to do, so first of all, thank you for being here. I looked at the others that were right now and I went, I'm not going to have anybody show up because. Yeah, he wanted to cancel. Yeah. <laughs> no one's going to come. Well, the, the, so the real story about canceling was I was supposed to be in Costa Rica right now and I just, I was two seconds from pushing the buy button on the Alaska Airlines site. And I had to type in my passport and it's expired. expired because I had to put it in the travel. So then I pinged Matt again and said, actually, you know what? I'm not going to Costa Rica. I can do this event. Um, but I was looking at the other ones at this time and I went, wow, there's some really cool sessions. So I figured if no one showed up, I would just go attend those. So uh, thank you all for coming. What I'd like to do usually is write on a whiteboard with what people want to get out of the session so that if I can, I can tweak it in real time to make sure that. Um, I'm meeting the needs of the people in the room. So I'd love to just first of all find out, how many of you went to Frank's session at Humble Sea? Is that guy that big or what? Yeah. He's just like the best. Every time I, I see him present, I'm just like, I wish I was that good. Um, how many of you have a small business? Okay. And how many of you have brand values? Cool. <laughs> Let's do just a quick raise your hand and let me know briefly what you were hoping to get out of this and why you're here. And I'm gonna do it for two reasons. One, because what I said, if I can tweak the presentation to better meet these, that would be great. The other reason is because I'm gonna be super honest, if what you really wanna get out of it is not what I'm gonna be talking about, or it's so far there that I can't really pivot the presentation or tailor it, I'm gonna maybe just close my eyes for a second and then let you get up and walk out and go to a different one. Because I, 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 one of the, I love these kinds of events, but in my uh, history of doing these kinds of things as an attendee, it's the worst when you go to a session and you have to sit through the whole thing, especially when you're trying to decide which other ones to go to, and you sit through it just to be polite because you think you don't want to piss off the presenter when you actually realize like two minutes in that you should have gone to a different one. Okay? So, fine, that's, that's probably, actually this is the first time I've ever done this presentation, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I haven't presented in live in two years with the pandemic, so it's, it's super weird to be here with a bunch of people. Um, okay, so quickly, what were some of you hoping to get out of this presentation, or, or why did you come? Yeah. So I own a small, this is Concrete Craftsman, so we're a precast concrete studio, and we're kind of re starting a new kind of thing a new business that's selling direct to market, like dining tables, hot and we're kind of rebranding the business under, under, I guess, creating a new brand, okay. which is my product line. And I've also just always run with Concrete Craftsman as a logo, and just the quality that you get out of it, I've never really branded that business. So okay. we're starting with Brandy Sandsman, and I also now probably transitioned to rebranding my other whole business. Okay, cool. Yeah, that, that'll, we'll touch on some of that. Who else? Yeah, go ahead. I work at Lookout Sanchez. I'm the director of sales and marketing, and we're a still a startup yep. newspaper in town, the newspaper. So it's like getting across a brand when it's a purely digital, not a physical thing that someone can interact with or talk to us about in the day to day, like a shop. Okay. Um, I was really hoping to learn like, how to package our brand and make sure it comes across in a digital space. Okay. Um, we're going to, I'll be talking, I'll touch on that. I'll be talking more about values and how we can guide all of that. Um, but I think it's close enough. Who else? Did you have a yeah, um, so I'm here at the Santa Cruz Warriors, and I'm just curious to learn a little bit about a balance between co-branding and staying like you need to yourself. But obviously, we're very closely tied with Golden State. Mm. Um, so a balance between like kind of working off their brand values and maintaining our relationship with them, but also like staying unique and true to Santa Cruz specifically. Interesting. So that was one where I made time a little bit. Because I actually think it would be cool for us to talk about that at the end. I haven't, I haven't thought about that when you're 
when you're a subsidiary or a parent, may, parent company may not be exactly aligned or you want to be have your own identity, how you would go through that. But it's something we can talk about, I think, for sure. Look out, by the way, it's cool. I really I love that you're sort of the new iteration of what publishing in Santa Cruz is. I, I really love what you're doing. And I know Matt's done some stuff with you as well. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I opened a state farm agency March 1st. I'm kind of a non-traditional agent, I'm not from the industry. So I'm doing a lot of personal branding, but I don't want to dilute one or the other because I do have a big brand name behind me. Yeah, you're, you've got an interesting one too, right? You want to have your own identity, but you, you're part of a larger entity that probably has its own values and brand and what they're trying to represent too. Yeah. It's an interesting one. I think we can talk about that at the end too. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm an upside writer. I'm self-employed and I have a clothing line, mostly kids' clothing line. And um, my push is to reduce textile waste to the landfills. And so um, the branding around that is, is a lot of storytelling and how people can be eco-conscious. That's my, my other company. The one that I'm going to be talking much about today is in exactly the same space. So I think that'll be super relevant. OK, so that's good. I think we're good. Uh, let, me, let me close my eyes, though. <laughs> if anybody decides they don't like my vibe or the fact that I'm going to sit most of the time, I'll just. There's some seats near the bell. I didn't hear seats. So, okay, so we're good. Okay, cool. So, use brand values to drive business success. I presented in the past at the 82% small business summit, which is, this is the iteration of that, with different presentations. And I wasn't sure if anybody had been to any of those, so I decided to try something new this time. So, we'll see. Jenny, how are you? Good to see you. So interesting to see old friends when I haven't seen them so long. But thank you. Okay, so so the first thing is I'm David. Um, I have th this is just a subset of all my email addresses because I have all these different hats that I wear and different identities. So depending on what your interest is, if you want to connect with me, um, I'll have more at the end. Uh, David at Ventana Surfboards. I'll be talking more in the context of my Ventana business today because uh, it's it, it really really focused the entire company on business values. That's how we started. David Den, at my, David Den at Microsoft.com is my day job. I've been at Microsoft for 21 years. Um, I work right now in the email space, so I'm part of the product development team for Outlook. If anyone uses email, uh, Microsoft email services, that's what I do. Um, I've been working out of my backyard for the last seven years on the west side um, for Microsoft, and so I didn't really realize the pandemic was happening because it was exactly what I've been doing for uh, for the last seven years, at least from a work context. Horrible pandemic, but for me, uh, not much change. So, uh, at least that was, that was okay personally. Um, that's my Microsoft identity. David at DavidDennisPhotos.com. Um, I do uh, photo exhibits, or I did before the pandemic, um, for nonprofits to raise money for the uh, for ocean conservation, homelessness, and education in Santa Cruz. Happy to talk about that as a separate thing. Microsoft supports those and they raise a bunch of money through photo exhibits that I do. And then D at Outlook.com is the easiest one to remember. And as I said, I work on email for Microsoft, I work at Outlook, I was in the room when we launched Outlook.com, and so a bunch of us grabbed super simple email addresses. So I'm D at Outlook.com and DD at Outlook.com. Super easy to remember if you want to get in touch with me. The only problem with that is that people use it all over the world every single day as a throwaway email if they don't want to get uh, newsletters. So my, I probably 50 or 60 mails a day. Like I think last week it was um, someone ordered Domino's in Malaysia and they used D at Outlook.com just because they didn't want to get the marketing mails from Domino's. Um, so that's the problem with that mail, but it's also really sweet because everybody can remember it. Okay, so I think this is less of an issue than it used to be. Brand is not a logo. Okay, a lot of people would say, oh, I need a new brand. It's not, brand is not a logo. Brand is in the hearts and minds of the customers, clients, partners, vendors, every prospects, every single person you touch. So for those of you that went to Frank's presentation, his just even the way he was dressed, right? He's got the mullet, and he was wearing socks and sandals, which fits with his brand, and he was wearing this super kooky outfit that didn't match. That was totally tied into his brand. Right? He's not a logo, but every single thing that somebody touches with your brand, and I'm super cognizant of that right now. Like thinking I'm representing Ventana and I need to make sure that I'm on brand, right? So the way I'm going to represent, present myself, the way that our logo is created, the way our visual identity is created is important, but our values, what we stand for, the partners that we work with, the way that we present ourselves on social media, the way that I talk about us when we're covered in the press or when I'm doing a podcast 
one of my partners being showcased, and he did a television show not that long ago. Every single tiny thing about our company is our brand. But you don't always have control over that, right? If you have a bad customer, if somebody has a bad customer experience, you may not be able to control the way they think about your company. But I want everybody to think more holistically about what a brand is. It's not a logo, it's not just a visual identity. It's every single touch point that everybody has with your company. And so one way that I've found, and others that I work with, Humble C is an example, um, have sort of kept their company focused on ensuring that everybody understands the way that the business needs to be represented so that everybody has the right experience is through brand values. When I uh, put together the vision for Ventana about nine years ago, um, I started with the values. What were the values that I wanted to align the company around down to every single tiny little splinter of a detail? Everything we're gonna do in the future is gonna align with those brand values because that's how I want us to be represented in the world and that's gonna help us connect to the customers that also are aligned with those values that we want to attract to our company and we want to work with. And I'm going to talk in a minute about this. There's little tiny details I want to show you, all of which map to our brand values. Okay, cool. So, quickly, beliefs that you as a business stand for or as an individual, what do you value? What do you care about? It's going to just, just literally, it should and can guide every single thing you do with your business. And it can be super simple, and it can be really, really cool as a framework to make sure you're making decisions easily, and that the people that, you work, that work for you are understand exactly how to behave and how to represent your company. They can also differentiate you from the competition, and uh, they may even be more important than the product or service that you have. Right? If one of your values is outstanding customer service, you may have exactly the same product. Insurance, great example. Right? Farmers insurance, there are lots of other agents. If one of your brand values is service over everything else, or one of maybe a couple of values that you have, we'll talk about seven of those in a minute, you can quickly, with a few experiences, differentiate yourself from everyone else. Costco and Sam's Club, pretty similar, right? What does everybody think of when they think of Costco? Deals, but the prices of the products are about the same as Sam's Club. Costco has the best damn customer service. Have you ever tried to return something to Costco? Yeah. Yeah. You just read my mind. I was actually just, that was my example. So I think I'm the only person that's ever been banned from returning broken surfboards at Costco. <laughs> and that's because my kids would, a whole separate story is why I started Ventana, but my kids would buy those foam ones and then they would try to go to Hits Beach and see if they could get shore breaks and break the board. And so we finally got banned from returning them, and my kids were banned from going to his beach with cost of surfboards. But they would just take it back, no questions asked. So if you have a Sam's Club down the street from a Costco, I don't know what Sam's Club's policy are, frankly, but Costco treats their employees extremely well. They've got tons of retention and longevity with their employees because of how well they treat them. They've got outstanding customer service, and the prices are good. But they have competition, but they've differentiated themselves with their values. And I could give you countless examples of that. Why product isn't always the most important thing, and having the right values and representing your brand in a unique way, even if the products or services are similar, can actually differentiate you from the competition. Okay, any questions about that or things you want to call bullshit on? Calling bullshit is how I learn, so feel free to say, you know what, David, that doesn't make any sense at all, you're wrong. Okay, let me talk about Ben Tom. And I'm, not, I'm not here just to pitch what we do. Uh, although, hey, if you want to buy a surfboard, feel free. Uh, the, uh, I want to talk about our brand value. So I started, I told you I started the company, or at least the vision, my partner and I, um, with the, the three brand values. And that, that, everything fell out from that. It was, what do we care about? What do we feel good about? What do we personally want to show our family and our friends that we're passionate about? What feels authentic? And it was three things. Artisanship, responsibility, adventure. When I talk about the company, when I introduce the company, when we're doing press, when we're on the radio, everything starts with that. We say, hey, we're all about artisanship, responsibility, and adventure. Let me tell you our story and why that's important and why it's unique. Interesting little aside, artisanship was not the original name. What do you think it was? Craft. Craftsmanship. Why do you think we changed it? Small. Better differentiate. Nope. 
Good guess, though. Yeah. Because you branched out to other things, not just crap. Because art sounds more Yeah, actually, I went back and looked at the definitions. Technically, we're artists and it's not craftspeople, but it's because of um, gender. As things evolved, the word craftsman didn't fit, right? That's why Ace is the place with the helpful hardware man. They don't say that anymore, right? We evolved. And so, rather than, especially if we were to bring in women to the organ, you know, my daughter helped build a surfboard. We've had um, girls come in from schools to help build surfboards. Craftsmanship just didn't feel like it fit anymore. So we changed it to artisanship. And so we do, we do evolve sometimes. But the reason why it made sense to make that change was because of brand value number two. When we talk about, and I'll show you more about this in a minute, but when we talk about responsibility, we mean environmental responsibility and social responsibility. And so when I went back and said, you know what, I think we should change craftsmanship to artisanship. It was a very planful decision because it maps to the way we think about social responsibility and being more inclusive. Now, your brand may not be responsibility, you may not care about that, but for us it was really important because changing the name of the first one mapped to the second one, an adventure. And let me talk a little bit more about this. By the way, mission is different than values. Our mission is to create the most loved and environmentally responsible surf company in the world. I can say that in my sleep. You should all be able to say what your mission is in your sleep. But then the values are how we do that. Okay, cool. Matt, keep me on time because I'll ramble okay. away. Um, okay, so every single detail matters. Every single thing we create, every artist that we work with, every product we come up with, um, our designs, our website, the way we present ourselves on social media is all about artisanship. So everything has to be super, super high quality. And the surfboards set the stage for that. Our surfboards are $10,000 to $15,000 each. Because the cra artist, I almost said it, the craftsmanship, although my partner is a man, so. Uh, the artisanship that goes into them is the highest quality and the materials are our, far and the most amazing in the world. I'll talk about that. So we, the artisanship of the surfboards then carries through everything else that we do. Our surf wax is specifically tailored for Santa Cruz. It's the largest bar in the world. It's made by an artisan in uh, back east, specific to a scent that we wanted that goes along with our boards. It's like this artisan piece of surf wax. It's $5 surf wax, $15,000 board. You have everything in between so people can access our brand, which is part of responsibility. Right? We feel like we have the responsibility to be able to create a, a sustainable brand that can be accessible by anyone, even if you can't afford to serve for it. Every single thing we do speaks to environmental and social responsibility and or social responsibility down to our t-shirts. We had to decide where we were going to get our clothing printed for the clothing we sell. We specifically went and looked at the different uh, uh, vendors in the, in the town that can do soap screening, and we made a decision they're all similar. This goes back to what I said earlier. Products are similar. We went with Barrios Unidos. Barrios Unidos is a, is a nonprofit. They do um, Latino, Latinx um, uh, education programs and anti violence training and a whole bunch of really cool stuff that we felt fit with our responsibility brand. So we picked Barrios Unidos to work with for our silk screening because we felt their values mapped to our values. Helped us simply, helped us pick a vendor. Really cool. Um, and then we donate a bunch of our profit to ocean conservation organizations. And we have a very specific way we do giving, which I'm happy to talk about. Adventure. Artistship, responsibility, adventure. Adventure is every single thing we create is meant to be used. Even if the surfboards hang on the wall, they're all built to surf, and they do, some of them. Our clothing, um, meant to be, got a nice comfy hoodie to go check the surf in the morning. Like everything is meant to be used in some way. So it's not just there to look good, it's also there to be used. Because we go out and we're out doing cool stuff in the world and camping and surfing and we want our brand to represent that. So those things all tie together. Brand values, I'm not gonna bring it up, but our brand values, um, we have it on the website. It's very clearly um, explained and why uh, it's important to our company and why it's a differentiator. This, um, this is an example of one of our product pages. Look how it's categorized. Artisanship, responsibility, adventure. So as we're describing the products, we're talking about them in the context of our values, right? And so each one has its own story around every single one of those brand values, right? Woman, a, a female artist, we like to work with women on businesses as much as we can, which goes along, we think, with the responsibility side. 100% um, uh, 
yeah, this one's 60% organic cotton and 40%. I think that's actually recycled polyester, although there's challenges with that, which we can talk about from a sustainability perspective with microplastics. Um, but there's a whole list of all the reasons why that's a sustainable hoodie. Uh, and then I mentioned, it's kind of a lightweight one for spring to go check the surface. So it's all about you know, going out and being used in the world. Um, so that's that. So that's, that's our brand values, and it guides literally everything that we do. One of the reasons why I'm here today is because of our responsibility brand value. We think we have a responsibility to help other small businesses in Santa Cruz get better. We've got a lot of room to get better ourselves, so I like to come to these to learn as well. But I, I'm here because I feel like it's part of our responsibility to work with the community and make, our, make all of us better. It maps to our brand values. If my brand value was being an asshole, I wouldn't be here today. It might be kind of a cool brand value for some ski <laughs> company, but that's not our value. Right? Okay, cool. Um, and this deck, by the way, I have a link at the end that will link you to the deck in PDF and uh, PowerPoint uh, formats. Um, so you can click on the links and, link through and uh, use this if you want, steal it, do whatever you want with it. Okay, let me talk about what time, how we got? Um, you've been speaking for 21 minutes. about 30 seconds to make. I'm gonna pass it around. Okay. Let me tell you the story of that little tiny bookmark and how that maps to our values and why that thing is actually way cooler than just a dirty old crappy piece of wood. That is made by my partner, who is one of the best artisans in the world, especially when it comes to surf and woodworking. He makes that, he does little things, he makes it perfectly sanded, you can notice that the corners aren't sharp, so there's artisanship around that. The hole is perfectly drilled, perfectly centered. Like it's a, it's even just little tiny details like that map to the artisanship brand value. Responsibility. So there's three things on that that are all trash. Back to the sustainability and upcycling conversation we started earlier. So that wood. Has anyone ever read, I'm sure everybody's familiar with Steinbeck. Has anyone ever read The Log from the Sea of Cortez? Or are you familiar with that book? It's a pretty, pretty well-known Steinbeck book that's inspired marine biologists the world over. There's a boat, I'll pass this around to you. There's a boat on the cover of that book, which is considered one of the most famous fishing boats in the world because Steinbeck and Doc Ricketts took it into the Sea of Cortez in Baja, California in 1940, doing one of the first science explorations of, of the Sea of Cortez, and then he wrote the book about the adventure, back to the adventure brand value, okay? The wood in that bookmark is from the hull of the original Western Flyer boat that Steinbeck and Doc Ricketts took in the Sea of Cortez in 1940. The reason it smells like diesel fuel is because it comes from the hull planks that were up against the engine room, and they used to slosh the oil out to help seal the hull, and, and it was, you know, years and years and years of, of oil, and that's why it smells, that's why it smells like diesel fuel. So, if I just showed you this crappy piece of wood, you'd say, who cares? It's this dirty old oily piece of Douglas fir. But when I tell you the story, artisanship, responsibility, it's literally, that was all gonna go to the landfill. And we wound up, I, long story about how that came about, but I built a partnership with the Western Flyer Foundation, that's the boat, and they sailed wood down here from Port Townsend, Washington, where that boat is being redone as a state-of-the-art research vessel for kids' ocean conservation research. And we donate money from the sales of any product that we sell that has Western Flyerwood back to the foundation, back to our 5% profitability sharing, which is part of our responsibility brand values as well. The, the string that's on that is made from the offcuts of these mugs. Some of you may have seen these around town. Um, there's a couple, um, Matt, I think you know Daniel and Kristen, quartz mugs. And these are made with paracord locally. And they have a little piece about eight inches long that's off the end of this when they're done wrapping it and they cut it and they just save all the scraps for us. It turns out it's 550 pound paracord, which is extraordinarily good as a leash cord to connect your leash to your surfboard. So we have these really cool looking strings that are actually just trash that are the best leash cords I think anywhere, which is part of the adventure brand value. And we put them on that, on all of our hang tags and all of our clothing use that, but it's also on that bookmark that little 
logo that's laser cut out that's on the bookmark is a piece of Honduras mahogany offcut from the Santa Cruz Guitar Company's guitar neck production here locally. Now, how much do you think that 30 second bookmark would cost if I were to sell it, which I am on the internet, on our, in our e-commerce store? Mm -hmm. $34. Okay, $24. The profit margin on that is extraordinarily high, <laughs> right? So, and that's okay, like we're not a nonprofit, we're here to, to make a business. And so we found a way to take other people's trash, map it to our brand values, artisanship, responsibility, adventure. I mean, that's one of the coolest adventures, Steinbeck going into Sea Cortez for six weeks and all the way wrap it out in there. And really, there's a whole bunch of other interesting insights with that. But our brand values guided the decision to not throw away the leftovers from the boat, but also from, we use this wood in our surfboards, we have lots of leftover pieces, so instead of burning that or throwing it away, we go, hmm, what can we do with the scraps? Let's turn it into bookmarks, and let's sell them for $24 each, and people absolutely love it. And then we buy the books, uh, we don't make any profit on the books, we buy the books from Bookshop Santa Cruz, supporting another local business, Responsibility, and we sell it as a package for $44. And people love it, because they feel like they're connecting with this great mission, this values, the the boat, some people have you know, literally gotten there. Some of you may know um, Jay Nichols, he wrote Blue Mind. He got into marine biology and marine science because of that book. So he cried actually the day that I, I gave him a piece of the boat. And it got burned in the fire, so I need to give him another one. Um, but it's, that's got a lot of meaning to people. So we figured out a way to literally turn trash into products, map it to our brand values in a way that connects with our the customers that we think are most appropriate for our business, and to be honest, turn a healthy profit. I'm gonna give you a secret. I don't know if I should say this or not. Our, our surfboards cost, cost of goods sold. The cost to make a surfboard, not including the labor, which is significant, just the materials themselves are about $200 to $300. They go for $10,000 and we're using trash to do it, but the trash that we use has incredible meaning. Let me go back, let me show you an example. That board is our it's number 100. Did you, if you were over at Frank's um, Humble Sea presentation at the, at the um, art gallery, you would have seen on the wall some rainbow wooden pictures. Those pictures are uh, art pieces, not pictures. They're made from recycled skateboards by a guy named Alex Wong of Upcycle Skate Art. He's a partner of ours, and he created these tiny little fish out of skateboard decks, right? So um, the, the, the cost is, they're beautiful. They have this amazing story, but they don't really cost much. Yes, there's labor, but all of this, this is from the Western Flyer boat. This, I think, is redwood floorboards from the 1800s from a house that was in Schwann Mansion, or in Schwann Lake. This is cork, 1400 laser cut fish scales in the shape of an actual fish that maps to these fish that's a surf perch that my partner caught off the coast of, uh, off the Capitola, um, goes along with the whole adventure theme. But anyway, we figured out how to take trash and do it in a way that really is connected to our brand values and turn a profit. $300 materials, $10,000 surf. It does take a long time to build them up, so there is labor costs. Okay, so back to the book one. All right, so let's talk about Humble Sea for a minute. Um, I met the guys from Humble Sea uh, in the context of Ventana. We did some stuff together. Uh, and I, they brought me on as a consultant to help them as they were trying to transition to becoming a bigger company, since I have large company experience as well. And um, I worked for free. I have a tiny bit of equity in the company now, but um, I worked for free for beer, uh, but I don't drink. <laughs> So I basically was working for free to supply my wife and humble seat free. <laughs> so, so that was good. Uh, I have re back to the brand value of responsibilities. I had a responsibility to get my wife free beer. Uh, so these were their brand values. And I'm going to take you through the, a little bit of the process that we came, we came up with for that. And Frank talked in the last presentation about how having a set of core brand values was important as they bring on new employees and as they really scale up. They've got over 150 people now. So that they had a simple way to explain to people what the brand was about and use it as a, as a filter for hiring as well. I'll show you that in a minute. 
And we have a giant list. We spent a good afternoon with the founders and their leadership team just thinking about what they cared about, what they, what they wanted their business to be, what they felt good about being a part of, what their employees felt, what they felt their employees would feel good about, um, what they wanted to show to their customers, how they wanted to, you know, what decisions they thought they should make as a result of their brand values. Anyway, we came up with about 40, I think, different words. And we just iterated, we just talked and we talked and we talked about why this one would work, and why that one would work, and why this might take them in the wrong direction, and why that one already fit with what was working in their business. And we came up with those five brand values. Kooky, and if you were at presentation, and Frank, and you saw how he was dressed, uh, Kooky is absolutely kind of number one, and that's why it's here. They want to be kind of crazy. Humble, open to feedback. Everyone contributes. They have a really interesting, um, he talked about in the last presentation, they have a Slack channel where everybody in the company can put beer names in, and there are thousands and thousands. Everybody in the company can contribute to beer names. And then they have a, he didn't talk about this, but they have a process where anybody in the company can also veto a beer name. So if every single person in the company wants a beer name, that they, they all, they come up with a short list every week of all the names they're gonna consider. Anybody in the company can downvote it on Slack. Um, if it has, you know, sometimes they'll do a name after an actor that, you know, is got, they tweak somebody's name to sound ocean-y. And somebody in the company feels like that actor has done something, you know, inappropriate at some point in his career. You, you can have the debate all day long about whether that's too woke or what the, somebody downloads it, they don't do it. And so they are humble. They go, you know what, we're gonna be respectful of other people in the company, and the company's feedback, and everyone contributes, approachable. They, they, and you go by and couple see on the one on Swift Street or the one the, the new one in Felton. There's just people there. It's just everybody. You can go and talk to the owners, and you can, you can. It, it's like this amazing sort of family atmosphere. And um, they want their beer to be approachable. They don't want to be snobby about it. They want everybody to be able to participate in what they're doing and their success. Innovate. So their beers are super innovative. I'm going to talk about that in the next slide as well. But if you heard what, what and I keep talking about the French presentation because I was just there and I know some of you were, but if you weren't there, he talked about their pivot. They pivoted the day that the pandemic closed everything down to move almost entirely online and their profits skyrocketed. It's the most, and I've been in the corporate world for a long time, it's the most incredible um, pivot I've ever seen in all of my years of business. They pivoted the entire business in 24 hours their profits went up 300% in a very short period of time. And it was because they were able to make a decision to pivot quickly before all their competition did. But that was part of their innovation. It's not just innovation in beer. It's innovation in business model. It's innovation in almost everything they do, including how they pivoted during the pandemic. Really interesting story. And then Righteous. So they're very, they have a lot of integrity. And Righteous is also kind of a, you know, dude, that's Righteous. Righteous Kasnar, that just basically is like, you know, kind of goes along with the kooky vibe. But they're, um, we helped, I helped them start a diversity, equity, and inclusion group, right? Because that's righteous. Right? That's the right thing to do, especially in an industry that's been white male for so long. And so that's an important part of their values. Yeah? I'm sorry, I just want to go back, actually, if you don't mind. Um, you're talking about brand values and partisanship um, and your cost of your boards. Uh -huh. um, do you feel that partisanship, that word, and what it represents, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. Not, so not only does artisanship play into the uh, value that you can, the, the price you can charge for something, um, it's also, uh, hey, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I was going to tie to responsibility in some way. Uh, because I do that with my yeah. clothing, too. Like, the fact that I'm salvaging existing material, there's so much yeah. mass off the world to use as my, you know, my fabric. Yeah. Oh, yes. Like, that I, that my yes. prices were higher for that reason. Overall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely right. But also, the quality has to be higher as well because yeah. that's what I was going to say. Something that's higher quality and lasts longer is also responsible, yeah. right? So, artists, just because you're using recycled or upcycled or trash materials, if the quality isn't as good as what you would normally buy new, right. that's a problem. That's why for us, artisanship is actually before responsibility because if it's not high quality, who cares? So. The responsibility approach plus the high quality artisanship, those two things are really important to go together. So yeah, good question. Okay, but here's some examples from Humble Seed. Talk about approachable. 
They put on an event, everybody comes, everybody talks to everybody, the owners are there, you can meet the brewers. It's super approachable and that works because everybody wants to come and be a part of that. Kooky, look at their labels. But that's also an example of innovative. Same with their, their board. And the names are kooky, the graphics are kooky. But this is for their uh, paycheck, that's Humble C5. And that's their fifth anniversary. Each one of these is a collaboration with a different brewer, uh, I think all around the country actually. Some of the top brewers in the world, or at least in the US. And so that goes along with innovative. They're constantly learning from other brewers. They're humble enough to realize that they can work with people, they don't know everything. And so this is kooky labels, but innovative beers working with others, which I would say is pretty righteous. Not one of their brand values. Cool. 10 minutes, David. Okay, cool. Check that out at the top. What is that? Job description. What do you see at the top? The brand value. They start with that now. Every single job description, they start with the brand values because they, they want to pre filter. If somebody comes in and doesn't feel they want to be in a professional environment, they don't feel like this kooky, weird vibe makes any sense, they just want to sell beer, they don't really care about representing innovation, then they pre filtered out their candidates. But then when they interview, they're, they're interviewing for that, that, that sort of vibe and those values as well. If I was interviewing at Humble Sea, the first thing I would do is memorize their brand values and I would go into the interview and I'd say, here's why I think I'm the fit. I'd probably wear a kooky freaking outfit. And I'd talk about how I'm always open to learning and how you know, some of the things I've done in my career are innovative and I'd be super friendly and approachable. And so I'd be thinking as an employee about how I'm after those brand values because that's what they care so much about. It's helped them be successful. Okay, cool. How do you set them? Because I know we don't have a ton of time, but I want to have a conversation. Um, think about what matters to you, to you personally. So you don't want to work at a company that is your company but doesn't map to the things you value in your life. Ask your customers, your vendors, your partners. Try to get a sense for what people think about you already, especially if you've got a successful business. And do more of that. Talk with your co-founders, your employees. What do they feel like the business represents? What do they care about? What kind of company do they want to work for? And think about the negative aspects. When I talked about insurance, right? If you know that the other people in your community that are selling insurance don't have good customer service, and that's a problem because you've heard it over and over and over again, then your value may be about customer service because it's a negative for everyone else. If the quality of the upcycled goods of your competitors are similar, I'm um, oh, sorry, the products are similar, but the quality is a lot worse. That's a negative for them, and that can be a positive for you, even if you're selling something that's similar, although my guess is what you're doing is very unique based on the fact that it's upside. Um, and then what we did, at least with Humble Sea, and this is the approach I like, is just write a whole ton of them. And then maybe work individually or with your founding team or a couple of your employees, and maybe even bring in some customers, and, work, and iterate until you pick the ones that really, really feel the best, like a nice shirt. And then you infuse them, like I've said, into every single thing you do. Yeah. I have a question that's kind of off topic, but not, um, which is about staffing. Mm -hmm. So I think probably most of us are struggling with staffing. Yeah. And it's equally, it's almost more important to me at this point to get high quality staff because yeah. without staffing, I can't grow. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how, um, like I feel like I've done that. I have really solid brand guy and I've done this, Great. but I'm struggling with how to infiltrate the staffing industry based on my brand values because I always say I hire people, I teach the skills. Mm -hmm. I can teach anybody anything, mm -hmm. but if they don't fit to the brand guys and they don't fit to representing what we're after, then I can't, I can't change that. And I'm really struggling with hiring right now. <laughs> Are you, is it because you're so desperate for hiring you're willing to kind of no. Oh, you're struggling with hiring the right people. The right people. I will not. I will. I will not hire. Maybe we talk separately because I can envision some interview protocols and some interview processes. And like I can't even get people in the door. Oh, so you're, you're having trouble getting people in. I'm, yeah. Oh, so you are. You are. Okay. So it's not that you're getting bad employees. It's that you can't get anybody. That's yeah, I won't hire bad employees. I just won't hire. But but the few people that are coming in the door, my hiring process is you know can be. Um, thought-provoking because I want to make sure I get the right people and so I want to be I don't know if I have a good answer for you I, okay. really, I mean I'll just be honest that's okay um, the only thing I can say is I wouldn't I wouldn't um, sh I wouldn't what's the word I'm looking for I would use 
don't don't hire people that don't know the values, right? Oh, right, which I don't. Yeah, be, and we exactly. have very low turnover, so. Yeah, be, be willing to, be willing to have the pain to get the right people on the bus. <laughs> yeah, so that's what, I guess the attraction is yeah, what I'm struggling yeah. with, with the low number of people out yeah, there. As soon as your brand, as soon as the people on, on the bus don't um, represent your brand with the right way and, and that maps to your values, then your brand's gone and you're totally. screwed. So yeah. don't give up on it. That's maybe the best I can do. But man, or maybe we talk one on one and I can okay. talk to Can I just say, Candace Elliott behind you is your go to person. She's Fortress Support. She can turn all about that. Good. When, so, when is your talk, Brand, uh, Candace? Uh, it's at three. I okay. Think. okay. Go to that talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just muddled my way through a shit. Uh, this is the subject too. Okay, cool. Uh, so I was going to have us go through this activity, but you can do it on your own. Write down some brand values. I was going to have us each kind of share some values and um, uh, talk about how you have or you could use that in various contexts and then how it personally contributed to your success. I gave you some examples from Humble C. I gave you some examples from Ventana. Um, but how much more time do we have? Five minutes. OK. Let's not do that yet, but let's like, uh, skip that one. Here's a list in case you want to start go through this process. This is There's probably 10,000 more of these, but this is a good start. And then incorporate, as I said, every single thing you do. The logo, I don't have time, but I'll tell you how this, I can, feel free to grab stickers. They're vinyl, so they're not super responsible, so I apologize, but they are printed locally, which is responsible. Um, but they, the, the individual, there's a lot of secret meaning in the logo that's map each, I can talk about our brand values and as to why we've chosen the logo to look just like it does. So grab stickers if you want. Um, the logo is important, but all the other things, what organizations you donate money to, or a surf company, you donate responsibly to ocean conservation only. Um, how your employees talk about your company, how you position your company when you're talking uh, relative to the composition, the competition, the press, podcasts, all the things I talked about. Your values should just guide it all. Okay, those are all my crazy email addresses. Uh, my LinkedIn is David Den. Uh, at Ventana Surfboards on every single social media platform you can imagine, um, and about 10 others that you probably can't imagine. Um, so please contact me. And back to the top, that's the link. Ventana Surfboards or Ventana.surf works also. VentanaSurfboards.com slash SMBZ. And that will redirect to a OneDrive directory with this presentation. OneDrive because I work at Microsoft and we make OneDrive. Okay. Thank you. Any questions or comments that we want to